Uh, welcome to folks who are just popping in. Um, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat? Um, just say like your name, your pronouns, and where you're calling in from. Got someone from Cincinnati. Awesome. Ooh, from Dallas, we got Rebecca. Ooh, in Austin, got some Texas folks. Ooh, Finley, Ohio. Rocky River, Ashtabula. Centerville. Yeah, and for folks who are just hopping in, I was saying people can introduce themselves in the chat. Just drop your name, where you're calling in from, and your pronouns if you feel like sharing. I have Sheffield Lake. So far, the farthest anyone has called in from is Texas. I'm Mary from Cleveland. And thank you all for introducing yourselves as I continue to admit folks from the waiting room. We've got Steven and Sonny from Cleveland, Linda from Westchester, Tina Collin from Austin, Dana from Columbus, Matt from Lakewood. It's great to see you all here and thanks for joining us today. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm just a brief introduction and just some Zoom etiquette and tips if you've managed to avoid Zoom thus far. So, well, first of all, welcome to Moving Forward on Ohio Energy Issues in 2021, HB6 and beyond. I'm Anastasia, I'm a member of Ohio Citizen Action. And while most of us are probably familiar with Zoom at this point, just in case, here are a few tips for today's meeting. So along the bottom of the screen, you're, you should see in the left-hand corner um, some options to turn your mic off and on and a sp spot to turn your video off and on. We ask that you keep your mic off for the duration of this event to minimize any background noise. If you accidentally unmute, you're just gonna get a little ping from me saying, and it'll be a little thing saying that the host has asked you to mute yourself. Um, you're free to leave your video on, but if you are having any trouble with your internet throughout this call, recommend turning it off. At the bottom center, you'll see the chat box, which a lot of you have been using. So definitely continue to make use of it. Drop your comments and questions in there. And we have folks moderating the chat who will re either respond in there or they'll pass your questions along to Rachel and Samia to answer. Also recommend that you view this in speaker mode so that you can always see our featured speakers, Rachel Bells and Samia Bray. You can find the option to change how you're viewing, whether it's speaker mode or gallery mode up in the right-hand corner of your screen. And now that we have Zoom etiquette and tech tips out of the way, I'd like to introduce Ohio Citizen Action's Executive Director, Rachel Bells. Rachel's worked with Ohio Citizen Action since 1996, initially as a Cincinnati Program Director, and in 2013, she became Ohio Citizen Action's Executive Director. During her time with us, she's pioneered good neighbor campaigns to help local communities fight nearby factories polluting their air and water, traveled across the state to prevent AMP from building a new coal plant in Ohio, and helped to bring community choice aggregation to Cincinnati, to name just a few of many hard fought campaigns. In addition to serving as the executive director of Ohio Citizen Action, Rachel also sits on the steering committee of the Power of Clean Future Ohio Coalition and serves on the executive committee of the REAMP Network. Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Anastasia, and welcome everybody. Thank you for being a part of this third installment of the Conversations Program. We're all eyes on, while, I, while all eyes are on the nation's capital yesterday, 
Today we're back here home in Ohio and we're having a serious conversation about HB6 and energy issues in Ohio. I'm particularly excited because uh, about today's program because I get to talk with my friend and colleague, Samia Bray of Black Environmental Leaders. She's joining us and we're both looking forward to your question. Ohio Citizen Action is the premier grassroots mobilizing and organizing team in the Midwest. We organize and mobilize people in person, by phone and online, engaging our members and supporters in actions that protect public health, improve environmental quality, and benefit consumers. As we inaugurate a new president and the pandemic continues to wreak havoc, the climate emergency remains as urgent as ever. And Ohio Citizen Action and our members have continued the fight here in the Buckeye State. We often work in coalition with like-minded organizations, including the fantastic group headed up by today's special guest. Samia Bray is the co-facilitator of Black of Environmental Leaders, where she's a respected and sought after expert on equity and sustainability. She's also a strategic business consultant and thought leader with a passion for cross-sector knowledge exchange and facilitating real conversations that engage leaders in innovative thinking. For nearly 30 years, she's provided consulting services in the private, manufacturing, and nonprofit sectors. She's a veteran of the US Army National Guard and honorably served our country for six years. Samia holds a master's degree in organizational systems design from the Baldwin Wallace University and a bachelor's degree with a dual major in business administration and interior design from Ursuline College. We're all thrilled to have Samia with us to kick off our 2021 series. We'll begin today's program with a conversation between Samia and I, and then we'll open it up to your questions. Remember, as Anastasia said in the earlier part of this, to ask your questions in the chat box on Zoom. First of all, I'm gonna make sure that I have the view. Good. Um, Samia, it's so great to see you. How are you doing? I am doing well. You notice I have my pearls on. Yes. So um, today, for some reason, the sun is shining bright here in Cleveland, but it seems to be shining just a little bit brighter than it did a couple of days ago. Oh, so yeah. I am well. How are you, my friend? You know, I'm doing okay down here in Cincinnati. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's sunny also. Uh, I feel the same. I will say uh, it's kind of interesting. We picked this date, you know, knowing of course there would be an inauguration on January 20th, but I don't think we knew quite how momentous it would be coming out of November, December, and then January. Yes. So yes. I was actually thinking we couldn't have picked a better time to have this conversation because I need to talk to you anyway. <laughs> We do need to catch up. It's been a while. <laughs> we really have learned, I think, to support each other in a few different ways, even though we haven't gotten a chance to meet in person yet. We got to know each other this year uh, yeah. or last year, last year. Yeah. Sorry, I'm still in the, sort of like a year's time frame, you know, 12 months. Um, it seems like I've known you a lot longer because I think we've worked in some of the same circles, various circles, but you're in the Cleveland area. And that's where most of our Ohio Citizen Action staff are. Yeah. But myself and Melissa English are in Cincinnati. So it's, I can't wait to meet you in person, first of all, <laughs> someday after the pandemic. <laughs> and thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. I know a lot of folks have been really looking forward to it. Yes, absolutely. And I, you know, I want to say, as you know, Bill, uh, I am a co facilitator of Black Environmental Leaders Association. Uh, we're located in Cleveland, but we serve Ohio. And uh, we are co-facilitators because every member of Bell is in fact a leader. And so uh, Jacqueline Gillen, David Wilson and myself, we serve together as co-facilitators of uh, Black Environmental Leaders, which stands as stewards of the natural and built environment through collaboration and partnership, like what we're doing today, to raise awareness and advocate for environmental and economic justice. And so I'm very excited about, I, I say that um, 2020 brought us many things. One of the things that it brought us was the benefit of an additional collaborative partner and ally in uh, 
in you and your organization. And for that, we are grateful. And we stand here today in gratitude for this time that we have together. Oh, you're starting to make me cry already. So you better, you better stop. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> thank you. I, I, I look, I know we both look forward to working together and we see each other. The funny part is we, we, we met, but then we keep seeing each other in a few, you know, we're in different groups together and we'll talk about some of those. So it's That's nice cool. because I've gotten to, we've gotten to know each other in a few different ways. And um, it's been really wonderful seeing your expertise. Um, so, okay. A lot of folks are joining today. You know why? because they want to know what the heck is going on in Ohio. Yeah. Why we had all of the, you know, I wouldn't say the world stopped on, on uh, July 21st last year when the, the Speaker of the House at that time, Householder was arrested and, and others. But a lot of things all of a sudden became somewhat more clear uh, how much the deck was stacked. And then we headed into the fall and the elections and things, and they didn't do anything. And we know people pushed because we all were pushing, all of our members, grassroots folks, and you know, volunteers, social media, everybody was pushing. Do something, do something, do something. They didn't obviously do that. Um, there wasn't a lot of time. There was no time to really organize a big, big thing around anybody's election. Uh, it seemed to me to be a thing that corruption is something everybody should be against, right? Yeah. Yes, it so, does seem like it. <laughs> so, so then we end up in this post-election yes. lame duck period in yes. Ohio. Every two years, we have a new General Assembly. So this is the end of the last General Assembly. And what, what, what could you help myself and the viewers understand a little bit more about what was going on heading into this lame duck and then what happened coming out in which them doing nothing was sadly the best of, 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 the, of the things they presented to themselves. Yeah, I think, well, one of the things that became clear for me is that the majority within, as we look at the polls and it shows the majority of people who looked at the results of the, uh, the, you know, the arrest uh, and, and the indictment of, um, as it related to and it was connected to House Bill 6, many people within the state of Ohio felt like, well, you know, it, it's a no brainer. They're going to repeal it. Um, they're going to replace it. And there was an expectation for that to happen. However, I like to say um, some, every, every thought that we have in our head is perfect when it's in our head and then there's reality. <laughs> Right. Um, and so <laughs> the reality that we all suffer through together, especially those who fought so hard in the first place against HB6 when it was being initially introduced and then passage, and all of those across the state who, who spoke to all the reasons why it should not move forward as it was written, to then understand that there may have been some other motivators behind why it passed. And then to see that in post lame duck, there was no movement to change that. It's a very disappointing place to be. And it's a place that makes one wonder, well, why is that? Well, today, the truth is we stand here and we do not know the answer as to why is that. But what we do know is this, it still has not been repealed. It still has not been replaced. That doesn't mean that it can't be. That doesn't mean that we don't continue to work in that direction. Um, but absolutely, it is a surprise, a shock, a disappointment. And I guess I just want to acknowledge those feelings and say that it's OK to have them. However, like we used to say in the military, if you ever get caught in a, in a, in a foxhole and uh, you get captured, um, you, you take it 10 seconds at a time, you do the next thing. And then you take a, you see what else is happening in the landscape and then you do the next thing. And so within the collaborative work, what we find is there are conversations that are happening. There are, um, there is a desire for communities to step up. And I would say to those listening, talk to your legislators, um, continue to let them know that you do not, if you don't, if this is your perspective, that you do not approve of the fact that there has been no forward movement. Um, because unfortunately, there's always another urgent thing. 
And if we just wait long enough, then people stop thinking and talking about it. And we cannot afford to do that. That's a really good point. We cannot afford to do that in so many ways. You know, it, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to stomach in a lot, for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is that there are a lot of groups like our, like our Ohio Citizen Action and the Association Bell. I mean, all of these and all of the folks um, that care for whatever reason on, on, on all sides of these issues. Let's talk for a second about the problem of corruption. Okay. And especially in Ohio energy policy, but let's be honest, it's not like it just, you know, <laughs> is a little box there, right? I kind of think it's an Ohio problem uh, that also then, um, because energy is a, you know, it's big bucks. And it, it I, I want to actually kind of hit into this too. So we don't have a comprehensive energy policy. We do in Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of a weird hybrid of sort of deregulation, but sort of not. Right. And how, how does this all play in with the, the corruption and the fact that, you know, a company like First Energy and, and all of their, I call it the First Energy family because it's all the different spinoffs and names and stuff, you know, give the money and, and, and help and really kind of control the legislature. And um, how, how do we, how, how do we, how do we step out of this problem that we've been in, this, this situation that we've been in and move forward um, out of this corrupt time we found ourselves in. I mean, it's the biggest corruption scandal in the whole state. Yeah. State history. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, <laughs> um, I, I've been around this political thing for a little while, so I, I don't know if I can say it's the, the biggest corruption scandal that I perhaps have ever seen because um, this, this, this issue of corruption within um, political life does tend to rear its head. Um, and when it does, for those of us who would like to believe that we serve in, a, we live in a world where the public servants are actually public servants, um, it can be very disappointing. So when you ask, you know, how do we, how do we get past it? It's almost like a game of whack-a-mole sometimes yeah. where, it, you know, it's like, how, how do we A, identify it and then B, what do we do about it once it's been identified? So I'm thinking about something that I referenced from time to time, and that is a story about the Canadian Mounties. And so as they were learning how to understand um, counterfeit money, okay, then what they would do is it was like, okay, somebody altered it this way. So everybody be, be on the lookout for being altered that way. And then, then another counterfeiter would alter it this way. And they say, well, be on the lookout for somebody altering it this way. And what they found is they were always following just two steps behind the counterfeiters, because as soon as they would figure it out, it would happen a different way. And so where they finally discovered was, how about we study what the authentic Canadian currency looks like? And if we become experts at understanding what the authentic Canadian currency looks like, then we can recognize any deviation from that. And so what does that have to do with what we're talking about corruption in politics? It, it goes to the fact of if we place our focus on integrity, even in the energy world, if we focus our attention on equity, that is treating all human beings as they deserve to live in an ad opportunity community, regardless of their economic or socioeconomic status, if we focus on transparency, that if someone has ownership in an organization and there is um, a benefit that comes from that ownership, that should be known. And if we focus on um, regular accountability, by focusing in those areas and having good energy policy that focuses on those four areas, accountability, equity, transparency, and a good strong energy future, that helps to raise those things of corruption to the surface because it's, it's no longer about someone else is the expert and we're waiting on them to tell us what is true. 
It's about integrity. It's about transparency. It's about equity. And it's about good energy policy that helps to reduce the effects of climate change, even in Ohio. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and you know, the interesting thing about energy policy, and I think a lot of folks know this, but it's worth it's worth stating that it's one of the things, not just the policy, but just energy, electricity, it affects all of us. We all, almost all of us use it. Almost all of us pay for it. Uh, almost all of us don't want to pay more. Uh, right. We would like to see better investments. We'd like to see investments that, you know, keep money in our state. There's all kinds of things that we need to see. And you hit on some of those things that we want to head into in the future you know, as, as, as meaning now. <laughs> so heading back to lame duck for one second though. Okay. So, um, you know, there was a crazy bit of, of, of time at the, at the last few weeks, especially in which it was looking like they were going to um, do the tiniest little bit um, and stick it into another bill, uh, some bill that was gonna get passed yeah. and then just allow it to be basically kind of like, that's the replacement, right? And that, that didn't happen. Uh, a lot of you know groups, our group, Ohio Citizen Action, Bell, we all sort of like work to stop that from happening because you, you don't get the chance again if they did that to right. then come back and say, you've done nothing and we now really need to do something for real, <laughs> which sounds so weird because that's sort of how I think of it when I was like babysitter, not, a, you know, not talking about adults that we pay to, to be decision makers in Columbus or frankly, D.C. So, you know, we, we need a lot more help from them. So the fact that they didn't actually get anything passed or snuck into something else was actually a victory. <laughs> sad, sad to say in a way, because it, need is, it needs, we need a lot more, but yeah. what happens next, right? We now are in a brand new general assembly for those not in Ohio or uh, new in Ohio. Um, we have a brand new general assembly, which is two years. So it just began. Yes. We have the same governor. We have the same speaker now, Bob Cup, after um, Larry Householder was uh, arrested, and we have a new uh, speaker. Uh, or sorry, we have a new Senate president. Yes. But you know, it's a lot of a lot of the same. What we what we also have right now is a really weird situation. Even in the last bit of time, twenty four hours or less, on this Public Utilities Commission chair. So yes. so we <laughs> let's talk about that for a second, right? <laughs> okay. So the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, the chair job is open because, and these are appoint, these and are- why is that, Rachel? This <laughs> is appointed by the governor. It's, it's open because Sam Randazza was the public utilities chair and he was horrible at, at the job, frankly, uh, but he knows a lot about utility policy because he fought on the other side against renewables and for fossil fuels. And, and you could just sort of, you know, sort of see that line for, you know, his whole career. He was very good at it. And uh, it was a terrible, we think, appointment to make him, by Governor DeWine, to make him the public utilities chair. And when that happened, that was part of HB6. That was part of uh, getting it passed. That was uh, how with the power siding board, because you're the chair also of the power siding board, they yeah. almost stopped and he, with the poison pill, worked to stop the icebreaker offshore wind in the Cleveland area, right? Though that spot is powerful. It is. But more powerful than I frankly even realized. Yes. Before someone like Sam Randazzo got in there who, you know. So what happened, to, let's, let's talk about this. What happened to Sam Randazzo? Is a house, his home was raided. His home was raided by the FBI yes. in was it November or December? It's I, I don't know. November. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't and, and, take and that computers long. and computers and documents were seized. Yep. We still don't know exactly what's going on there. We but what we did find out just a little bit later, maybe it was a week or so, maybe it was a bit more, but we found out that there was a, at least a four million dollar transaction between First Energy and uh, Chairman Randazzo. And that there was a lot of, um, at the very least, the optics of quite a bit of impropriety because First Energy had just before this dismissed their own CEO. So there was all this, you know, swirling around and Sam Randazzo re resigned. And then he resigned. And then he resigned after a lot of pressure <laughs> from groups like Ohio Citizen Action and Bell and, and all these groups we get to work right. with, right? Because he was the, he was, you say a wolf and she, or she, yeah, wolf in sheep's clothing. He was the very epitome of the wolf in sheep's clothing 
over the PUCO. So now we have an open seat and we have another seat that's, you know, there's a renewal. So there's another process there. So there's actually going to be two possibilities, but what just happened. Yeah. We're is, still waiting. The FBI is still doing their investigation for both. The FBI is investigating. Uh, and, Governor DeWine seems to still, you know, not think that Sam Randazzo was the worst choice in the world. And when given a choice to have a consumer advocate, of the list, the short list that was presented, Governor DeWine just just turned around and, and said, bring me a new list. Yes. And while that can happen, um, it's, it's disappointing because there were at least two people on the list that were very tied, are very tied to utilities mm -hmm. and uh, worked there, you know, um, I mean, you, we can run down the list, we don't need to, but very tied to utilities and then two that weren't. And, and one person uh, was taken, Judy French was taken off the list because she became um, the Department of Insurance, the head of the Department of Insurance. But now there's still this seat open. Yes. Who the heck is controlling Governor DeWine? I mean, how disappointing. Hines want to know, wait, now I have, a, I, ha I have a prop for that question. Yeah, let's see it. That's the elephant in the room. And this is, by the way, this is, this is non-alcoholic ginger brew people. Um, yeah, that's the elephant in the room is um, inquiring minds want to know. Uh, we don't know at this point and we don't, you know, we don't want to, um, you know, suppose who we might think it is. But one thing that I was taught at an early age and I will share with this group is um, hmm, keep living. Um, as we continue to do what we can, where we are with what we have, these things come to bear, um, which makes it even more important that any new clean energy legislation has to have deep levels of accountability, deep levels of transparency, um, because these things hide in the dark, whatever they are, they hide in the dark and they leave question, even if there is no impropriety, it can appear like impropriety because things are lurking in the dark and we don't know what they are. And that could, you know, especially when people's houses are getting raided, uh, computers are being seized and it's all connected to their connection or engagement with, unfortunately, a, a House Bill 6 that cannot for the life of it seem to get repealed or replaced. I know. I know, right? It's almost like there's people who just want to keep it in there, right? Just want to keep it as it is, huh? Right? So what's it going to take? Let's talk about that for a second, right? It's a crystal ball. It's Ohio. Okay. But oh, okay. we so have a new general assembly. Wait, I, I hate to interrupt, but I have to say this. Before we go there, let's just stop and look at Ohio for a second. <laughs> I mean, I know that we have friends in the room. So, you know, we're just friends talking to friends about House Bill 6 in Ohio. Okay, so here we are. Ohio is what we call a Rust Belt state. Why do we call it a Rust Belt state? Because we were so heavily engaged as a, as a state in manufacturing. And another area of Ohio is highly agricultural. So agriculture and manufacturing. So now our world is changing and it's moving toward renewable energy and energy efficiency. However, Ohio has benefited in many ways from those industries, even though they've changed. And people have been accustomed to those industries being their livelihood. You know, one of the things that breaks my heart and also I find very intriguing is the notion that someone could work in a coal mine and it could cause them health issues and they know that their life expectancy is limited as a result of it. However, they would still go to it because that is the livelihood that someone could work near a nuclear plant or in a nuclear plant. And they know that their life expectancy is shortened as a result of it, yet it is their livelihood. And so as they're making that decision to live, they're deciding to not only live, but to fight for that livelihood so, and then we add where we're going, which is renewable energy isn't quite just yet at the place where it can completely replace those 
forms of energy production. And so in order to make the transition, that means that there's a gap and who knows how long the gap is, right? Like I said at the beginning, in our head, everything works perfect. But what if it doesn't work out perfectly just the way we think it's going to work by making the shift to clean energy? And it takes a little bit longer. People still need to eat every day. People still need to take care of their families every day. People still need to pay their mortgages every day. So one of my superpowers is the ability to understand and have some empathy for, I could see why a person would be against making those transitions. Um, so here we are in Ohio, we have what we've done for hundreds of years that has sustained many people within the state. We have those who see a future that could also sustain us. And then we have right here where we are, where the transition isn't quite there for it to be a one-to-one -one switch. So now we have legislation that takes a step in that direction, but we're not sure if we can trust it yet. We're not sure. So what do we do next? What do we do next? We make that transition and it happens, I think, partially with what we're doing today. We have conversations like this to say, how do we collectively move that together? Um, and it's not an all or nothing kind of thing. You know, I, I have a, a friend that he gets in the car and, and it's either all the way off with the heat or all the way on with the heat. <laughs> uh -oh. like, but there's so many gradients in between. <laughs> there's so many in between. And I think in Ohio, <laughs> as we look at clean energy policy, that there are incremental steps that can be taken. However, I can also understand simultaneously the fear to make some of those incremental steps or the concern about making some of those incremental steps and they don't work out. And then we, we end up in a worse place than when we started. Um, yeah, and you know what else I was actually thinking? There's also the piece that's not specific to Ohio, you know this, human nature, where people wanna know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And there are times, there are plenty of times in which big things might be coming to your community, to your county, nearby. If you don't feel like you have, I'm not even gonna say a say, but like even some of the knowledge about what's going on, a lot of times, even before you might even get the say, a lot of times that puts people on edge and it makes them, you know, it almost sets them on the, puts them on the other side. So we have to have more conversations. We have to have many more conversations across all the spectrum because, this is one of those things in which even under a governor DeWine, in which we may not agree with much, right? There may, there's lots of things, you know, he, he did, he's done some good things during the pandemic, certainly some things I don't agree with. So, you know, you could look at that. Yes. I will say though, he has said, and he's not strong on this. So this is a problem too, but he has said an all of the above energy policy but that would actually mean that renewables and energy efficiency and, you know, wind and solar, like those would be one of the, some of the things that are in the all of the above, yes. but that's not what's been happening. No. They've literally been, you know, shoved aside at exactly the time when the rest of the world is not only making these big investments, but making big um, investments in their own future and their own, you know, producti productivity in their own region. So we're, it's just another way for Ohio to be behind, somewhat behind, <laughs> right? Um, you know, I, one of the things, I, we were against HB6, what became HB6, yeah. the bailout and yeah. first nuclear, but then coal and all this, you know, we were against that from the whole thing. We don't, we don't like it. We would, we would like to just see it repealed, frankly. Of course, I but agree. Yes. That's not what, what uh, the decision makers keep um, saying within Columbus. Now, the more they hear from their constituents, their own voters, you know, that all changes. But one of the things that, that you know, especially in the last half of last year, even after the scandal came out and everything is this concept. So one of the things that is so important is the fact that there have to be a lot more people at the table and all these conversations, including workers, including, yeah. you know, all, all of the above. If you're going to say, again, all of the above yeah. and not thumbs on the scale. Yes. And that's what it seems like with the corruption all around the whole legislature, the, the, the corruption around First Energy and Sam Randazzo and the PUCO. And, you know, 
I honestly, I, I, I really became, came to the place last, at the end of last year where it's like, I don't think any of them trust each other, even the people in the same party. I, I mean, I'm not saying nobody, but I think that there's a whole lot of mistrust <clears throat> each, each different um, representative, senator, you know, as you go. Yeah. So, well, okay. in, in 2013, I'm thinking about globally, in 2013, for the first time, as far as permits for energy production, um, renewable energy sources, permits for renewable energy sources outpaced uh, permits globally for fossil fuel production. And so 2013 is really where we had the shift. That's seven, eight years ago. In that seven or eight years, we have seen in different places tremendous growth in the renewable energy space to the point where some places have been able to get to a level. Uh, one of the places that, that just absolutely fascinates me is Texas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, Texas was known for fossil fuels and oil and all of this. And to see over that this last eight years, how far Texas has come as it pertains to um, wind power and solar power, and even looking at some of the farmland that no, they were no longer doing crops with, that they've now began to understand and harness the notion that clean energy could actually be as, um, as lucrative, if not more lucrative, because the infrastructure doesn't exist. So let's talk about that for a minute. And the, 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 the transportation industry is dipping its foot in the water. I should say the, the car buying industry is dipping its foot in the water on this notion that I'm speaking of. And that is um, the infrastructure that is required for renewable energy doesn't exist. Not right. all of it, right? right. And so in the, this is the one time in history that an infrastructure is going to be built. After this, it'll be about maintaining that infrastructure. But from an economic standpoint, there is so much opportunity to build the infrastructure and to be able to create a workforce around that. I mean, that's what uh, yeah. the whole Build Back Better conversation that uh, President Biden is speaking of speaks to is, we build that infrastructure and in that infrastructure, there are jobs that may never exist again in the future. And from that comes a transition. And so now you're starting to see Ford coming out with an electric vehicle. Uh, I think I just read a couple of, uh, about last week, I think GM has just introduced that by 20, I think they said 20, don't quote me, I think it's 2025, 2030. They intend to, it's 2035, it's gotta be, um, that they intend to introduce um, close to 20 new models that are going to be electric vehicles. And so it's like anything, when legislators, when industry, when those in the supply chain can see how it can benefit them, not only benefit the world as you know the, the climate, but also benefit them economically, then they can get on board. And I just don't know that Cle excuse me, Ohio is there yet in that understanding. We're still perhaps focused on what has supported us to this point, right? which has been fossil fuels. Right. And, and that's self-preservation. That's Maslow's hierarchy of need yeah. level one all day long. Well, and that actually is a great entree into the Power Clean Future Ohio campaign Absolutely. that we're both part of, because yeah. that is a large part of why Power Clean Future Ohio local efforts across the state are so important, just getting going, because you can't, even if there's great things going on in Columbus, you, there, we need to have it happening in our own communities. And in Cincinnati, you know, we went from an aggregation campaign about 10 years ago or so to, and we, we supported wind farm in Oklahoma with our renewable energy credits, how we got, had to get started, to now we're putting steel in the ground in nearby counties um, with solar, you know, supported by my community, Cincinnati here. And so, Cincinnati, okay. let me, you know, I gotta, wait, know, wait, before you go, I know, I know you're on a roll. I have to introduce, I have to introduce, I, I mean, interrupt. I am interrupting. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm owning my interruption. Okay, I want to talk about, um, I have to, I can't let you leave. I have to talk about um, renewable energy credits. I have to. Well, you renewable know, renewable energy credits is like having your cake and eating it too. 
It's, you know, you, 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 you don't do the, the energy efficiency or the renewable energy work locally. You do it somewhere else because it's like water, right? If you drop a, a drop of water in the Bahamas, how do you know that drop didn't end up in Ohio? You don't because it's all connected. So it's, well, same thing with like, energy, you it's know, not like you were saying with the transition. You know, it, we, if, if, if in 2012, when we, when we did this in Cincinnati, we had to have the steel in the ground, it wouldn't have happened. Yes. So you have to figure out strategically where you're at in the moment. And let's be honest, Cincinnati is not quite as conservative, seen as conservative, and it isn't as it used to be. It's still more conservative than Cleveland, for instance, right? But that's why I can tell these are not conservative progressive issues. <laughs> These are everybody's okay, issues. So now I, I've got to put it on the table that I think we need to consider the titles that we put on things, right? Because when we say things like it's not conservative, and if somebody identifies as conservative, that immediately says, right. not you. Yeah. And that immediately puts yeah. a division. That's true. What I meant to say was um, more of a version, uh, really an older school version of, of the of the concept that, that um, that people would be against it because people yeah. Yeah. this is yeah. this is what yeah. i know rachel every one of us have taken a series of breaths since we started this conversation right when we started 40 minutes ago each one of us took a breath we needed that breath right now we're all taking a breath we need that one too and we needed to have some clean air associated with it um and about an hour from now we're all going to take a breath again it doesn't matter if we're conservative, if we're progressive, right. if we're whatever differentiator we want to put on that, that doesn't matter. Each one of us are, there's one race, the human race. Each one of us are human beings that require a breath in and a breath out. That, you know what? I'm going to stop you. We have to take questions, but here's why I'm going to stop you. Because this is what I love about you. <laughs> you challenge me. You challenge me, you challenge each other. And it's good. I'm saying, uh, you're right. I did I did kind of slip into the, you know, us. Then we see each other as the yeah, enemy. You right. know what we can't do? And that's this is you right. and me, right? Right. Is everybody else here with us. <laughs> cool. If we see each other as enemies, you know what would happen? There are some people who would say, you and I should never be friends. And if we had listened to that and allowed that to be, you know what we wouldn't be? We wouldn't be friends. Right. And I have learned so much from you and you shared for me that you've learned so much from me. Oh yeah. And that human connection overrides all of those other differentiators. Now there are some people who are, are the beneficiary of those differentiators. And so they wanna keep them. They have a vested interest. So this goes back to perhaps a cousin to corruption, right? If I am an entity that is benefiting from the current state of things and there is rapid change that's coming that I really can't stop, but I can at least slow it down. Then I have a vested interest in trying to make that happen. I know some people look at corruption and they go, oh my gosh, that's horrible. But I look at it this way. Clean energy and good renewable energy and good clean energy policy is inevitable. I like the matrix guys, it's inevitable. Um, all we can do is really slow it down, but it will still move forward. Just like that breath that we all took. Yeah. We could hold our breath, but eventually we're going to take yeah. another one. We're gonna take another one. Move forward. So the question is, will Ohio be at the tail end? Or as the saying goes, some people make things happen. Some people watch things happen. And some people wonder, what happened? What happened? Is Ohio <laughs> going to be the ones that, that wonder okay. what happened? This, um, is, this, is, this actually leads into the first question. This is perfect. Yeah, of a lot of people want to know, and again, we know we don't know, but let's just pr prognosticate for a minute. What would we re replace HP6 with? So yes. What are even some bullet points? So, so here's some, re some, some research that myself and a team of folks that I've been working with have been doing. There's some really good examples throughout um, the country uh, that can give some insight to what we could include in there. So my area of focus, it tends to be on good energy policy that is also uh, wealth building for all Ohioans. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about the Future Energy Jobs Act that Illinois um, brought to bear 
Um, there's some good nuggets in there. Uh, now, I warn you, anybody that wants to research that is all of 800 pages, the legislation, um, but it's good stuff. Um, there's good policy in there. There's a lot of great things that have been going there's, on in Illinois. You're absolutely right. Things. For yeah. two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, there's also some good things happening um, in California. Um, people say, well, you know, they're different than we are in California. And that's when I default and say, well, no, no, they took a breath like we took a breath. I think we all take a breath. So there's not, there's some differences. Um, if it's in our benefit to keep it different, then we will do that. Um, but one thing I know about nature, and I know we have to take some questions. One thing I know about nature is nature always wins. So we can have all these debates, we can do all this stuff, we can have policy, we can not have policy. And at the end of the day, we will all be gone and nature will replenish itself. Yeah. So that's a good, that's I'm, a really good You know, I'm a, I'm a probabilities person. I think a probability of our of our success as humanity is what's to get in alignment with you with with nature. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and, and that means, you know, that's not saying that we're all gonna be tree huggers, even though some of us are. Um, yeah, some of us are, Samia. We, some of us are all, tree huggers. We, we are all oxygen. We are all oxygen breathers. Right. Uh, and totally so agree. it hey. is important. It is important that we get in alignment, even in our policy. And there's lots of questions here. There's a lot, but you know what? I got them right here. I'm just going to okay. feed them to you, so you don't have to worry about it at all. I'm in charge of this, and everybody up in my staff is helping me do this. So it's it's really fun. Okay. So here's a really important. You know, you're going to know why this is so important. I'm afraid the urgency to repeal HB6 will fade and people will forget about it. What can I do to make sure that doesn't happen? Keep, stay, first of all, stay connected to shameless plug, uh, Ohio Citizen Action. Um, they will not let you forget. <laughs> <laughs> they will not let anybody that you know forget. So I would say stay connected to them and anybody that you know have them get connected to it, uh, to their publications, the website, follow that. The other is to continue to reach out to your legislators. Um, let them know of your discomfort because they're, okay, I can't speak for another person's intent. All right. What I can say though in human nature is some folks move with the drumbeat that if you just don't talk about it, it'll go away and people will forget. Right. You don't forget. If you continue, even if it's just periodic, you put it on your schedule. Oh, time for me to send a letter again. Oh, time for me to send a letter again. Um, and then as many of us to continue um, beating that drum of we did not forget. Because through the polling, it shows us that I think it was over 60% of Ohioans disapprove of a House Bill 6 and want it repealed. So it's not even a question of yeah. if the, the constituents of which our legislators speak to that they represent do not want it. Yeah, um, that's a good point. That's a good point. We don't. Okay, so let's talk about how, look, this is something that's true on anything legislative. So it's not just Ohio and it's not just HB6, but okay. So when you're looking at creating a win-win situation, one of the things that's really important to do is to try to figure out, you know, what the other side, or not even the other side, but the other um, position or positions perspective need, need perspective to, to have to to be able to get past this stall. So we know that there's the policy piece. We know there's things that need to be in it. We know that, um, however, you know, whether it's standards or market no, or just at least not putting your thumb on the scale against renewables and things like that need to need to change because that did change with HB6 you know it, it really kind of dampened at the very least the very very modest standards we had incredibly modest um, on renewables and efficiency but creating a win-win within Ohio which is very still very um, there's not a decent bipartisan balance some some Midwestern states have a have a better like there's just it's it's not quite so like there's not so many in one party versus another party. And we have every single thing in the in the state is run within the Republican Party. We've also been a state about you know 20, 30 years ago, it was all run by the Democrats, right? So it's not really great either way in these instances. How can we actually but but here's the thing about HB6? Here's what I think is weird, but interesting. So the corruption of HB6 seems to be bipartisan, but so 
was the people who were against it. There were some pretty solid Republican. They would they would identify themselves as more conservative, right leaning, you know, uh, probably against you know taxes and things like that. That voted against HB six, and their you know constituents didn't want it and all that. And there's some Democrats who, for all kinds of reasons, also voted against HB six. And then you had Republicans voting for it and Democrats voting for it. So weirdly, it was one of the most bipartisan things even though it was corrupt, even though it was terrible to have happened recently in Ohio. So one of the problems is that it's one of those shape-shifting things where every time you take a little thing, you plug something else in, everything changes. How do we get to the point in Ohio where we can actually have a win-win? You know, and I know we need to move to another question, but let, what, what, listen, I mean, listening to each other, how do we get them to even listen to their own constituents? Yeah, I, you know, that's each individual per each individual legislator's choice. And then that's up to those constituents that they represent to say, is this individual representing me? There's so many people and you know, I, okay, so this may be a little controversial, but I am going to say it. So I just give you the warning, turn your, turn your, turn your sound off if you don't want to hear it. I'm giving you the warning now. Um, there are some that were really upset about our previous president and they were very angry about a lot of things that he did as you know, am I some of the things. However, one of the things that I am very grateful to is that his presidency caused people who never paid attention to civic life to not only pay attention, but to become scholars. Scholars at every level, local, state, and federal. That's a good reminder. That civic engagement is I think how we turn that around because people rather than go to the poll and say oh that name looks familiar yeah they've been the incumbent forever so I'm just going to vote for I might you know my house hasn't burnt down yet so I'm still going to vote for that person things are okay for me they're now beginning to look at the legislature what did that legislator vote for what did that legislator vote against what, what on on issues that are important to me on what side of that decision was that legislator and does that legislator's position represent what I as voter expected or voted for them to be in that position. Right. I think, especially as we look at the polls, when we see 60% of Ohioans, more than, were against HB6, but yet our legislators, I, I, I think that means that the legislators aren't necessarily voting the way their constituents. Yeah, I think it was even, I, if I remember correctly, it was even higher than that. Yeah, That's what I think it was. Was, that was across all kinds of districts. Absolutely. Right. But okay, what so I was, was that by us having a heightened understanding of civic life, that more people, I mean, I'm hearing, you know, folks talking at the gas station, you know, people, my teenagers, right? that never really, they were interested, but they weren't, them and their friends. I mean, we I was taking them somewhere and they're having this intense discussion, 15 and 16 year olds about um, Nancy Pelosi being over 80 years old and 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 Schumer and and they're talking about these individuals and they're understanding who they are. And then they are, then they said, by the time we have another election, we'll all be 18 and we can vote. And then somebody said, but will we be 18 by the mid, by the, um, the midterms? And then somebody said, so it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. People are paying attention. And, as we, paying pay attention. Attention, and we have to keep paying attention. Yeah. Well, he, paying attention. Okay. So here's another one. Here's one of the things that ties, you know, ties all of this together is DeWine, Governor DeWine, yes. right? The POCO thing, legislative. He signed that bill 12 hours, you know, later. He, he didn't. He didn't stand, he's been pretty wimpy on this. But here's a question. Didn't DeWine also get money from dark money groups associated with the first energy scandal? Yeah, that's what it's looking like. According to the news sources, that's what it's looking like. But you know, I have to take a quick aside and then I'll come back, I promise. My heart is still broken over the fact that he signed Stand Your Ground for Ohio. Yeah. Um, because it all ties in. It all ties in. Yep. Um, we'd like to segment it all and say that energy and, and all of that isn't connected, but it, it does all tie in because it all speaks to how does a legislator make their decisions? And yeah. if that transparency is not there, if that accountability is not there, um, or if it needs to be strengthened, that accountability, that transparency, that equity, 
perspective. If that needs to be strengthened, any legislation that that legislator or that governor is making a decision on is impacted. Yeah. Okay, so wow, here's, uh, this might be a good one to sort of close out on a couple okay, things. Here. I'm before I thank everybody. It was gonna be quick though. Why hasn't Larry Householder been convicted for his corruption scheme? If he's convicted, will that automatically appeal HB6? No, it will not. We know it doesn't, right, but okay. And he's also still in his seat for the moment. I know he that still, Wait, his constituents reelected him. Well, that's true. He was running How on- How did that season. happen? Another Ohio problem and, and happens all the time. But look, okay, so here's what my, here's how I would answer it. If like one of my staff was asking me in a briefing, the wheels of justice move slowly. Um, the FBI is involved. There's a lot of stuff that's been coming out. There's a whole lot more. There's going to be more indictments. I, didn't say, I mean, yeah. this is not over with household. It's not over. Just, no, and no. also for people who are in Ohio or maybe haven't followed, two of the people um, um, turned turned state witness. So there's two of the five household. Five. One of them, two of the five yeah. that you know are giving in, information against them. So to me, it's like. I don't know if this is either a, 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 a not not a well thought out, you know, Hollywood movie or just a really interesting reality TV show because that's what it feels like to me. <laughs> no, I think I think that one thing I know I've observed over my career with the FBI. Um, everybody on the call, stay out of their radar. Okay, um, they are they will watch and monitor for years. Yeah. And yeah. by the time they move in, there is so much that they have. There is so much that has been amassed that it pretty much is impossible to say it wasn't you. Um, so yeah. everybody on the call, mm -mm, stay <laughs> out of the FBI's crosshairs. You learn one thing. And I think that's what's going on right now. They are moving through their, um, their investigation. They have the documents that they have. They're looking at all of those ancillary connections that may be associated with this. Um, and, and before they make that move, as many as they can pull in at that same time. So don't be surprised. I mean, we had it here in Cleveland. Keep when, watching. Um, when, when, when Jimmy DeMora, I mean, he's been in, in you know, when, when that uh, happened, uh, he had been active for years, yeah. decades. Yeah. And um, the FBI had been watching and absorbing. And then now he's been in jail now for, I think, over 20 years Yeah, um, as a result um, of those choices. I know we need to close out. I just want to remind people, first of all, I'm going to thank you in a second. Uh, follow Ohio Citizen Action via Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Remember to join our Repeal HB6 Facebook page. Check out our website, ohiocitizen.org. Sign up for our email list on the homepage, become an OCA member. And I think most importantly, I want to thank Samia for joining me. It was really great to see you and the audience for getting to hang out with us. It's like our fake little podcast. Yeah. And I really want to thank especially all the Ohio Citizen staff, members, and folks who helped put this all together, because this is not something that we you know, used to do. We've only done this for, for a little less than a year. And while the pandemic has kind of been a reason why it was an impetus to do it, it was, it's a really great way to keep in touch with everybody. Uh, don't forget that there's th these and other videos on the website, ohiocitizen.org, and also our YouTube channel, Ohio Citizen Action YouTube tap channel. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And thanks, Samia. I hope to see you very soon. Indeed. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for your time. Be well.